Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. I want to invite you to our service this morning, wherever you're watching us from. We welcome you. Feel free to join us in praise and worship and even receiving the word this morning. So I just want you, wherever you are, to just lift your hand to the Lord. And we just want to pray and to praise him and to give him all the glory as we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, even as we start this service. We pray that you speak to us, Lord. We pray that you minister to our hearts. We pray that you will encourage those who are discouraged. We pray that you will uplift those who are lowly, dear Lord. And we pray that you will meet at our point of need this morning. In the name of Jesus, even spiritually, we give you glory. We worship you. Just lift your hands and give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. He who was, he who is. And is to come. He's a faithful God. Even as we invite the worship team to take us through a, a time of praising the Lord, just stand on your feet wherever you are and let us praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jehovah Jireh, Mungu wa Israel. Hakuna mungu kama Jehovah Jireh, mungu wa Israeli. Hakuna mungu kama wewe.
put your hands together and celebrate Jesus for his goodness and his faithfulness. Hallelujah. Put your hands together. All the praise belongs to Jesus. He is worthy. Yeah. Everybody say, every praise, yeah, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Help me say, every praise. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah, Glory, hallelujah to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Sing with me. Every word of worship is to our God. Every praise. Hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. One more time. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Sing God. God, my Savior. God, my healer. God, my healer. You deliver me. God, my deliverer. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. One more time. hands together celebrate Jesus hallelujah come on yeah put your hands together Jiti nguvu si mama umshindi tawala 
unakibali Saidizi wako ndani yako Saidizi wako ndani yako inuka inuka jitie nguvu simama umshindi tawala One more time. Inuka se inuka jitie ngu si mama si mama umshindi tawala unakibali saidi si wako yundani yako saidi si wako. Jente ule ulivyo na nguvu umepewa uwezo na roho wa Mungu usife moyo mte ule ufalme ni wako umridhi pamoja na Yesu nieleze jente ule ulivyo na nguvu umepewa uwezo Oh, 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 Mungu, usife moyo mte ule, ufangme ni wako we, umridi. Pamuja na Yesu, inuka, inuka, jitie nguvu, si mama, umshindi. Hakuna mungu kama wewe bwana Hakuna mungu kama wewe bwana Wa milele wa milele Wa milele mungu baba Wa milele Wa milele mungu baba Put your hands together Come on to celebrate Hakuna mungu kama wewe bwana Hakuna mungu kama wewe bwana Wa milele Wa milele Wa milele mungu baba Wa milele Wa milele Wa milele mungu baba Wewe wa milele Wa milele Wa milele Wa milele, 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 wa milele
wewe wabariki wabariki ye wabariki we wabariki mungu baba wewe wabariki wabariki ye wabariki wabariki mungu baba Hallelujah. We thank the Lord for his goodness and faithfulness. We're going to take our scripture for this morning uh, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, the whole of Isaiah 35. So let's read. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. Even with joy and singing, the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellence of our God. Strength the, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the dusty land springs of water in the habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, a road and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the, the, that, the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there. Nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and, the, and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Hallelujah. Let us re, uh, repeat the last, uh, the last verse. The, um, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. What an encouragement we have this morning. The Lord encouraging us that we should not be fearful. And he says that, say to those who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. Hallelujah. Do not be afraid this morning of what is happening in the nation and in the entire world. Because the Lord is for us and he is together with us and he is fighting our battles and he has hidden us. Therefore, we shall fear nothing. Praise the Lord. So we want to change gears and uh, invite our father, Pastor James, to come and minister to, uh, to us the word of God. Welcome. Thank you, Esther, for work well done. Good morning, everyone who is present here with us and those that are viewing this lovely mm -hmm. service. I want us to go back to the study of the Word of God. We've been studying on the fruit of the Spirit, and I want to begin in the scriptures in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 15 to 20. The Bible says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, therefore by their fruit you will know them. I'm reaching out for that verse 20, therefore by their fruit you will know them. It's a very simple, basic principle upon which we 
are studying this word of God, the fact that every fruit makes or declares or makes known the tree thereof, and the fruit follows the nature of the tree. A good tree brings forth a good fruit, and a bad tree brings a bad fruit. Let's move on to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 33 to 37. The Bible says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or either make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Let's go back to verse 33 again. For a tree is known by its fruit. So what about a believer? What about a son of God? What about those that are born of God? Having been born of God, there is a fruit that is expected, that is required, that must be seen of us, and that is the fruit of the Spirit that we are sharing here and bringing an impartation. We are not only sharing information, but we are bringing an impartation and so that all of us can be edified and challenged and encouraged to produce after the kind of our God. Our God is good, and the fruit that comes out of God and through us who are his sons and daughters, that fruit must be good. About four months ago, I got a prophetic message from the Lord that the healing of the nations, even in the current global crisis we are going through, will come through the fruit of God, which is the fruit of the Spirit. God knows how that is going to happen, but I tell you the healing of the nations the healing of our people, the healing of our believers, the healing of our families will come through this fruit that only comes out of God through us who are born again. So what is the fruit of the Spirit? It's the fruit of Christ in us. It's the fruit of Christ in us because when we got born again, Christ's life in us became the seed. When we got born again, Whenever any man gets born again, Christ's life in him becomes the seed that must come to maturity and fullness in order to produce the corresponding fruit. To be born again is one thing, because it means that we have received the nature of God and we have been brought into the family of God. But to bear the fruit of the same is another thing, because bearing of fruit requires maturity. So when we got born again, a seed was sown in us. It's the seed of Christ. It's the life of God. It's the life of Christ. And it is out of that seed, Christ, his life in us, that now a tree is coming forth, and upon that tree then the fruit of the Spirit. This fruit of the Spirit is the manifestation of the Christ in us. Christ is inside of us, but fruit must be seen on us. Christ in us, but fruit must be seen on us. People will not pick on the Christ who is in us, but people will pick on the fruit that is coming out of the Christ who is in us, which is the fruit of the Spirit. People may not identify or clearly discern the Christ in us, but people will always so clearly see the fruit that is on us, just like in the case of a tree. People hardly see the seed that was sown to produce a tree. But people will see the fruit on the tree. In fact, people are not drawn to a tree for any other reason apart from the fruit that is upon that tree. So the fruit of the Spirit is the manifestation of the Christ in us. It is the manifestation of our relationship with Christ. Now that we are connected to him, now that he is the, body of, of the, of, of, he's the head of the body, now that we are born of God, now the life of Christ manifesting in us will manifest that relationship that we have with him. The fruit of the Spirit is also a statement of our maturity as sons of God. You don't pick fruit from immature trees. You don't pick fruit from trees that have not gone through the stages. And fruit production, the production of the fruit of the Spirit, is always a statement of the nature of the measure of the maturity of a son of God. 
And the fruit of the Spirit is also a statement of godliness and Christ-likeness or the image of God in a believer. Can we go back to John chapter 15 again and look at verse 1 and 2? John 15 verse 1 and 2. The scripture says, I am the true vine. And these are the words of Jesus. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. And so the fruit of the Spirit is connected to this tree, this vine. And Jesus said he is not true vine. Christ is the true vine. In other words, then, the fruit of the Spirit does not come from any other place or other source. It comes from He, the Christ. And while as He is the true vine, then we, the believers, are the extensions of Christ, just the same way that branches are extension of the tree. Branches come forth or branch out of or extend from the main tree. Christ is the main tree. And the believers are the extensions of Christ. We are the branches of Christ. And I want you to notice the fact that there are two types of branches. There are branches that are fruitful, and there are branches that are fruitless. There are branches that are fruitful, and there are branches that are fruitless. And all these branches are in the vine. So all these are believers. They all believe in Christ. They all believe in his word. They all have the hope of the redemption they all have the hope of the new life which is available and possible and made available for us through Christ. But yet, some post as the fruitless branch. So what happens to the fruitless branch? The Bible says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So the Father will take away, there will be a disconnection, there will be a judgment of God on every branch and everyone that believes in Christ, that has become part of Christ, and yet is not fruitful. And God would judge such a branch with the view and with the direction of challenging the branch and challenging all of us to be fruitful. The other type of branch is the fruitful branch. And what does the Father do on that particular branch? That one, he prunes it, he cleanses it, he prepares it so that it can be are more fruitful. So please take note of that. There are two types of branches on the same tree. On what side are you? Are you part of the fruitful branches? Would Jacob say of you, like he said of uh, his son Joseph in Genesis 49 verse 22? Would Jacob say, Joseph, you are a fruitful bough. Are you a fruitful bough or are you a fruitless bough? The fruitful is blessed. Joseph got a double portion blessing. His two sons were blessed and they were included in the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. But someone like Reuben, for not being fruitful, for not producing what was expected, we see him being cut off. Maybe not completely, but we see his blessing and portion being reduced and taken over by another simply because on the day or the night, that Reuben should have produced a fruit, maybe self-control, maybe patience, or whatever it was. On that day, he was not fruitful. And so, I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that you may not completely be removed from Christ if you have confessed him and believed in him. But if you are not fruitful and not producing the fruit of the Spirit, you will be limited in your expression, your enjoyment, and your experience of the new life which we have in Christ. I pray for you that Genesis 49 verse 22 will become real for you. Joseph, you are a fruitful bough, and your branches reach over. They go over the wall. They are extending over and over. Your fruitfulness is not limited even by a wall or a limitation because our fruitfulness is not by our own strength, but it is by the inner working and outward working of the Christ who is in us. And because Christ is limitless, and because Christ is, does not have scarcity or shortfall, we have the faith and the trust that by his help we can be fruitful. To the end, we can produce whatever is required at any one given time for the glory of God. Two types of branches. Some are fruitful, and the Father will keep pruning them so that they can produce some more, and some are not fruitful, and they are cut off. 
I pray that none of us will be cut off for failure to produce in due season, in due time, what God expects of us. You know, fruitlessness is a statement. Fruitlessness makes a statement that the owner of the tree has not taken good care of it, has not watered it, has not put manure and fertilizer and whatever else is required. But the truth is, and we do know that, that God in Christ has made every provision necessary. He has made every necessary provision for us. And so to fail to produce the fruit after the kind of God is a statement of disobedience. It's a statement of rebellion. And that's why that kind of branch that does not produce after the kind in due season will be cut off. There will be a measure of curse and limitation of enjoyment and experience of the love of God in such a branch. Reminds me of the tree in Mark chapter 11. Jesus saw a beautiful tree, green, looking wonderful, very promising. And on coming near that tree, there was no fruit. And we do know that in that Mark 11, Jesus cast the tree, not because of any other thing, but because there was no fruit on the tree. Fruitlessness leads to judgment. Fruitlessness leads to a cutting off and a taking away. Fruitlessness is not a good thing at all. I'll tell you this. The fruitless do not enjoy life. The fruitless do not enjoy life because the very nourishment that God will give you and the very seed you must sow for present and future generations is locked up in the fruit you produce. See, every fruit has two parts. Every fruit has the food part, the pulp we love to eat, the juicy part of it. But at the core of that fruit, you find the seed. To fail to be fruitful is the same as saying not to have the seed that is required for future generations. But the same God who provides bread, what we love to eat, is the one who provides the seed. And yet the bread and the seed come from the same source, and they come from the same God, the bread to feed you, but the seed to be sown for the future. So the fruitless don't have a future. Fruitlessness will cut short and cut off dreams of the future. Fruitlessness ends up with visionlessness and lack of purpose and objectivity in life. But when you make fruitfulness the, ob the, the, the focus of the, the life we live, then we begin to walk into dimensions that are in God as God purges us so that we can produce not only fruit, not just more fruit, but much fruit. Look at this. While as Christ is the true vine and we are the branches, that means the tree produces the branches. All right? Branches come out from the tree. So while as the tree produces branches, branches are supposed to produce fruit. The fruit is never on the tree, the trunk. The fruit is never on the trunk. What you find on the trunk are the branches, which become the extension of the tree. And then on the branches, the extension of the tree, that is where you find fruit. Christ has produced you and me, the branches, in the hope that then you and I can produce what Christ brought us to himself for, and that is to produce the fruit that makes the statement, yes, we are born of him, and we have the new nature in us, we have the new life in us, we have the new a seed of God within us, the seed of the life of God. The branches must produce fruit. The fruit that branches produce reveal the nature of the tree. So ultimately, all that is locked up in Christ, all who he is, and all that he has done for us, and all that is available for us in him, must be made manifest through the fruit that is coming out of the branches, the believers, the sons of God, you and I. So ultimately, fruit reveals this relationship between us and Christ. That is why Jesus said in John 15 that the Father is glorified in our ability to bear much fruit. The bearing of fruit is what manifests sonship. The bearing of fruit is what manifests the Christ within. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. 
And the way that new creation is seen and appreciated by those around us is when the fruit of the Spirit is seen, is discerned, when that fruit can be picked, when that fruit is observed in a consistent, continuous way in our lives. Therefore, friends, we must begin to weigh these matters. We must begin to consider the issue, the matter of our fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. Christianity, being a son of God, being born again, is more than giving a testimony. It's more than dressing like a churchman. It's more than attending services on Sunday. It's more than church congregations. It is about being fruitful. Now that we are born again, that's what John the Baptist told them, now that you have repented, can you produce the fruit after or the fruit that shows that you have repented? And now that we are born again, now we must produce the fruit that shows all and sundry that indeed something has taken place in our lives. The testimony which is just words of men is not enough. Many, in fact, don't respect that. But no one can argue against the manifestation of the new nature as a way of life because of allowing God's own spirit to produce within us the nature, the character of God. Please note that our fruitfulness is connected to the pruning process. But before I come to the pruning process, let me say that every tree produces after its own kind. Therefore, the sons of God produce after the nature and character of God. So anything that is seen of us, anything that became part of our lives, our thinking, our mentalities, our lifestyle, that is not included in the nature and the character of God, that then must be counted as a member in us which is in the world, and we must allow the Father, the loving Father, to prune or cut that off because that, if allowed to stay on the tree, it is occupying unnecessary space and it will hinder the fruitfulness of the tree. Please note that the secret of fruitfulness is in abiding in Christ. And abiding here implies a continuous, consistent relationship of endurance. Let me repeat that again. Abiding in Christ implies a continuous, consistent relationship of endurance, of enduring, until Christ is fully formed in us. So fruit does not mature in one day. You know, in in the, in the land of Israel, where God instituted seven feasts from the first month to the seventh month, it's almost one for every month, although they are scattered in between those months, you discover that when they celebrated the first feast, Passover, it was during the harvest of barley. And then when they celebrated the third feast, Pentecost, it was during the harvest of wheat. When they, have, they celebrated the last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, the feast at the end of the year, the feast of the ingathering, they were harvesting fruit. In the land of Israel, fruit takes longest to mature. Fruit does not just mature in a day. It takes long. It takes long for the fruit to mature. It takes long. It takes a walk of consistency and commitment. It's a walk of commitment is a walk of consistency and there is endurance you don't get tested or tempted once and then you give up and go away you don't fall once and give up and say this thing is not possible you continue you uh, insist consistently continuously endurance until Christ is fully formed in us because the fruit of the spirit is actually an expression of the measure of the Christ within no Christ, no fruit. No Christ, no fruit. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in me, if there be no Christ, then there will be no fruit. And if we be not in Christ, then the fruit of God cannot be in us. No Christ, no fruit. More Christ, more fruit. Fullness of Christ, fullness of fruit. So the secret, therefore, of 
being fruitful is in abiding. You are abiding in him. This consistent walk, the relationship of endurance until he is fully formed and the process of the formation of Christ will last you a lifetime. Every day the Father is at work within us to perfect us, to complete us. Every day he is at work. Every day we are on the anvil. And the Father is over there with his hammers and his sledges and whatever tools he must use to beat us to shape and form. He is busy working until we are fully conformed to Christ by the process of being completely transformed from the form of this world to the form of God called Christ, who is the image of God. Fruitfulness depends on the pruning process. Successful pruning, successful fruitfulness. Have we done pruning? Have we done fruit? Fruitfulness depends on the pruning process. I remember sharing from Hebrews 12 and I said, that the, the methodology of God to prepare us for fruitfulness is chastising. Hebrews 12 uses the word chastising, but John 15 uses the word pruning. Both of them are painful processes that God will subject every believer in the hope that when this is done, fruit can be found on them. Pruning is a process. And pruning is a function of the Father. Remember Jesus saying, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser or the husbandman. In other words, it's not Christ working on you, the branch, so that you can produce the fruit of Christ on, your, on the branch. It is the father who is keeping, who is watching, who is tending that tree. In other words, then, the father has determined that out of every believer will come forth the maturity, the complete form of his son, Christ Jesus, so that Christ is the head or the source and we are the body or the expression of Christ. So that then on this branch of the tree, the fruit that was found on him, Christ, as an individual, can be found on us as a corporate body, the sons of God, but not without pruning. John 15 verse 2 says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, that one is cut and taken away. But the one that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Pruning. We cannot stay away from pruning. No pruning, no fruit. No pruning, no fruit. You know, during the pruning process, and I thank God I was born on a farm, and my parents are farmers to date. The coffee plants or bushes are actually one of the best trees to use to illustrate the pruning process. Every season, my father would go to the farm and cut off all the suckers, that's what they call them, all the suckers and all the old, tired, broken, ugly branches, some branches that have got no leaves. And you know the, the branch will need the leaves because the leaves help to produce the food that the tree must eat. And he would cut, and sometimes a tree which was green and bushy would be left looking like it is, it's just having some very few branches. And I would ask my dad, why do you do that? You tell me, I will get more crop with a few branches than with the many, some of which are not fruitful. He would tell me, this one produced nothing last season. I have no hope that it will produce anything this season. This season. And he would cut it off. And that's the pruning process. And oftentimes, God is looking at our lives, looking at areas of our lives that are not producing after the kind of God, some things that are conformed to this world, be it in our thinking, in our lifestyles, in our preferences in life, in our, in our spirits, in our minds, and that branch that does not bear you cut off. But the one that produces, that seed in you for prayer, that thing in you that loves God, that thing in you that loves giving, that branch, the Father will come and clean it so that it can continue bearing more of the same kind. So the pruning is important. No pruning, no fruit. Because through pruning, the father cleanses or removes impurities or the unproductive things within us. And from Galatians chapter 5 verse 19, there's a list of things the Bible calls the works of the flesh. And these are the unproductive things in us that the father will cut off. The summary of the same is the works of the flesh or the old man or the old nature. That 
old men will never produce. It is, there's no hope that the fallen man can ever produce after God. But the new man that came out of seed of Christ, whose life in us became the hope for the new expression of the new creation, then God will cleanse that new man and fashion that new man to produce cleansing, removal of impurities and unproductive aspects in our lives. That's the pruning. It's a painful process. And remember what I said on Wednesday night? There can be no fruitfulness without pain. No pain, like they say, no gain. No pain, no fruit. Fruitfulness comes through a painful process. And by that, I'm not implying a sorrowful process you don't enjoy. Not so. I'm referring to a process, yes. It is painful, but it must become every believer's joy and delight. We must take delight now in the pruning of the Lord. We must take delight in the rebukes of the Lord. We must take delight in the rebukes and the corrections of a father, the chastising of a father. And you know, no chastising feels good at the moment. You know, our daughter the other day, we were just having a chat. And one of the things she told me is, Dad, I'm forever grateful that you were tough when we were small girls and you are raising us and disciplining us, she said, because without that, I am not sure I'll be what I am, doing what I am doing, where I'm doing it. But then she told me, but at the time when we were young and you are such a tough father, disciplining us, I didn't enjoy it, I didn't like it. But she says, but now I appreciate. And she says, thank you, Dad, for what you did. Not chastising feels good when you are a two, three, four, five-year-old girl. But when you are about to get married and there are all these virtues seen on you, the fruit is on the bough, the fruit is on the branch, then you remember there was a purging, there was a pruning. There were some ungodly, worldly things that would have attached on her life. And as a daddy, I had to come in. Just the same way a heavenly father has to cut off anything that is not productive to allow room for what is productive. And so, friends, pruning is a must. We must now begin to get more comfortable with the inner workings and the inner dealings of the Holy Spirit. Because without that, we might remain branches that are green, but never producing fruit, only giving hope, but no reality. And the day might come when the Lord Jesus will come by and cast a tree. And the tree dries up overnight. Let me move on now and uh, say that this process of bearing of fruit has got to do with a responsibility. No fruit without bearing responsibility. Bearing fruit has got to do with carrying a burden or a responsibility, being responsible. Only responsible sons produce the fruit of God. And that's why Jacob would say about Joseph, Joseph, you are a fruitful bough because of all the 12 sons of Jacob. Joseph was the most responsible. And we do know that when his brothers came to Egypt looking for grain, it is Joseph giving them grain and returning their money and hiding some of his cups in their bags. They come the second time and he does the same thing. Ultimately, the whole of the family of Jacob came into Egypt and they came through a medium, through a mediator, the man Joseph. And through Joseph, they were allocated a piece of ground called Goshen, which means draw nigh or come near to me. And all this is happening, the salvation of an entire family happening because of one son, and yet this is a son that the other brothers wanted to kill. Thank God for Judas who said, let's, not Judas, but Jude, uh, yeah, Judas. Thank God for Judah, not Judas, but Judah. Thank God for Judah who said, let's not kill him, let's sell him. And they sold him. That fruitful one. And you can see he went through more pain, more trouble, than they are. The more responsible you are in God's kingdom, the more fruitful you are likely to be. Irresponsible sons of God are not fruitful. Fruitfulness comes through a lifestyle and a commitment to be responsible. And by that I simply mean being one who stands to be counted. Anything God wants done, you are there in the front line, offering yourself. It's like when 
Isaac wanted to bless his son and sends his son, go get me something. And we know that Esau took the whole day and brought nothing. But in the meantime, Jacob takes responsibility with the help of the mother, prepares what the father was asking for, gets it on the plate, brings it to the father. The father had doubts whether this is him or not. Anyhow, he took it and blessed him. And Esau is still back in the bush looking for something. You know what? Jacob got the blessing because he took the responsibility. And his responsibility did not begin on that day when he gave his father the venice on the meat, the meat he desired. His sense of responsibility started when he became a farmer. His brother was a hunter, running after animals that are growing wildly, having no responsibility, feeding nothing, not taking care of any goat or any sheep. But Jacob took responsibility. The Bible says he was a farmer. He was already working with his animals, taking responsibility. Responsible sons will bear fruit. They'll bring forth. They'll give birth. They'll produce what is required. And the fruit we produce is a manifestation of the Christ in us. And, and simply defined, Christ is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. In other words, everyone produces what is in them. You cannot produce the fruit of God if there be no nature of God. If there be no spirit of God. In terms of religious activities, we have come to the day of the reality of Christ. You either make the tree good, and the obvious outcome of the tree will always be good in actions, in words, in thoughts, in every other thing. Or if the tree is bad, the obvious result will be the works of the flesh, and it will be the bad, the undesirable, that which causes the Father to cut off such a branch. Christ, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. We need such an abundance or a fullness of Christ. We need to come to the maturity and the fullness of Christ, the full stature, the full measure of Christ, because fruit comes out of the abundance of Christ in a man. You can't pretend to have the fruit of the Spirit. You either have it or you don't have it. You either make the tree good and have good fruit, or if the tree is bad, the fruit that will come forth of the same is actually not good. That's why Galatians 5, let's go to Galatians 5, 22 to 26. Galatians 5, put it on the screen please, Galatians 5, verse 22 to 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying, envying one another. Go back to verse 24. Verse 24 again. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. You know why that is the case? Because as long as the flesh is given room and is alive in a man, the flesh will produce after its own kind. And verse 19, up there says the fruit, the works of the flesh, and it's listed down. If there be flesh in a man, flesh will manifest, will produce a fruit. But if, according to verse 24, then if we be in Christ, if we have Christ, if Christ be who is and what is inside of us, then out of Christ, verse 22, 23, will come for the fruit of the Spirit. I told you that the fruit of the Spirit is actually the fruit, the fruit or the manifestation of the Christ within. Christ is also the measure of God's grace in a man. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. Let's have a look at that. Christ is the measure of God's grace in a man. Look at it. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so this measure of God's grace in a man becomes part of the foundation upon which the fruit of God, the fruit of the Spirit, can be produced. And again, we can define Christ as the foundation and source of all divine activation. We define Christ as the foundation and source of all divine activation. Now, friends, I have just shown you that Galatians 5, 
22 to 23. And it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And the top on that list is actually love. I want us now to look at Christ's model, how he modeled the fruit of the Spirit, beginning with love. And so we are going to become very practical now, from now and in coming days. Let's look at Christ's model. How did he model love? This takes me to Matthew 5. Go with me to Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48. And if you are taking some notes, you can also write next to Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Take also down Luke 6, verse 27 to 35. It's the same story but told from different angles by the two different writers. But let's use the Matthew 1, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In the day that Christ was ministering, that was the thinking and the belief. You love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I said to you, he comes to change. He says, but I said to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Look at that. He takes love beyond the general fruit on the fig tree called the Jews. He takes it to the new tree, the tree called Christ, the true vine, and begins to show them the level of fruitfulness that was expected of them as far as God is concerned in the day of grace, the day of divine enablement, and what he is telling them is actually modeled in his life. I will show you this as we progress with the teaching. Do you remember Jesus on the cross forgiving someone? Forgiving someone who was calling him names on the cross, going through pain. The last moment, the last words that came out of his mouth was, Father, forgive them. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. When the Bible in Galatians 5, 22, 22 talks about love, that's not going to talk about loving people, you know, who are nice to you and liking people who do what you like. This is something more. It's agape. It's the God kind of love where one lays his life down for others. And that's what basically Christ did. Love your enemies. Look at that. Some of us have been priding that we are completing the fruit of the Spirit. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you love your enemies? Do you bless those who curse you? Because that's the Bible. That's what Jesus did. He, he said, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Do you do good to those who hate you? Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And when you read such scriptures like this, they begin to reveal the fruitless branches in us. They begin to reveal things and aspects in our lives that truly are not bearing the fruit of God. And time to pretend and hide and cover things is over. God has jacked that religious system. We have stepped into the day of the reality of Christ. The day where his life is in us. The day where for us to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And if it be that this is the day where Christ, for us to live is Christ, then this is the life. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Think about it. Praying for those who persecute you, is that what we love doing? We are living in a day where the church has taken vigilance. Anyone against us, anyone opposed to us, Anyone who speaks against us, anyone who is working for our downfall, you know, we begin to deal with them perpendicularly. We do not bless our enemies anymore. We do not pray for our persecutors anymore. We have taken vigilance. We are killing. We are slain. Now you can see why there's a curse in the land. Because the people that should be redemptive to pray even for persecutors, to love even enemies, have swung into demonic carnal activity and the earth is full of darkness until a people now can arise and produce this fruit because the healing of the nations 
will come from the fruit of the Spirit. You think of how this earth we live in can change overnight. If we decided, all of us here and at home, decided from today, I have no enemy. And if anyone declares to be my enemy, it's their choice. But as for me, I'll keep loving them. I'll not curse anyone. If anyone curses me, I'll just bless them. If I don't hate anyone. If anyone hates me, I'll pray for them. I'll not persecute or do any evil or wrong to anyone. But if anyone chooses to persecute me economically or socially or domestically or politically, whichever way, persecution can take many shapes. Some people might choose to persecute me, but as for me, I will shock them. Because while as they have declared to be my persecutors, when they come near me, the first thing I'll say is, let's pray. And you begin to pray and bless them. They will be shocked. Some will open their eyes in the middle of the prayer. Why? Because something is coming out of you that is not what they expected. It's the fruit of God. It's the nature of God. It's the character of God. The branch now has fruit. And the Son of God in you is being manifested. Not through a long testimony, but through what is being seen of you. Pray for those who spiritually use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your father. Hey, how about this for a definition of sonship? We've been teaching about sonship for the longest. And many of us understand the teaching now. But now, the time for the product, the fruit, the practicals of sonship. Practical sonship means loving people. When we do that, when we love all, including enemies and persecutors, that's the way to be sons of our Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Let's be like our Father. God sends the rain to both the righteous and the wicked. The rain will fall in the shamba, the farm of the pastor, and the witch next door. But oftentimes God finds the pastor cursing the witch. We think that we can work out the righteousness of God through the anger of men. We think that vengeance is ours. We think that judgment is our own prerogative. We want to execute the righteousness of God and the vengeance of God on the earth by the application and by the activation of wicked principles, the works of the flesh. You can never defeat your enemy by hating them. That's why the healing of the nations is locked up in the fruit of the Spirit that is coming in the earth from Christ through the tender care and pruning of our Father. And the fruit will land in the earth through a people that become sons of God, the branches of the tree. Think about that. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. Do not other evil workers do the same. They have organizations. They have formed institutions that bring them together to enable them function even better. Even witches have their own organizations. So if we only love those who love us, we are not different from the world. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Because others also greet their own brethren. Certain tribes think about their tribesmen. When certain people are sent to power, they remember their tribesmen. They say it's our time to eat. So if a believer does the same thing, that I'm only going to bring my brothers in Christ, what have you done that is different? You have not yet begun to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And listen to this. Your life is endangered because that branch will be cut off. You may lose the opportunity, the privilege, the open door might just shut. Because God did not put you in that office and in that advantageous position for your own personal use and good. 
He put you there for his own glory. Remember, every branch that does not bear fruit, the Father will cut it. I pray you'll be the branch that is bearing fruit so that instead of being cut off and taken away, the Father will keep cleansing you, clearing the way for you to arise and ascend to a higher, greater place of influence and wealth and riches so that you can be able to love and embrace more people on behalf of God so that you can be a living witness. You can be part of the witness company that witnesses of the life of Christ in this day. Therefore, verse 48, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So loving the way Christ loves or the way Christ prescribed is one of the ways to come to perfection. And perfection, the standard for our perfection is our Father in heaven. That, that simply means that when the Father is purging every branch so that it can bear more fruit, he purges the branch with himself as the standard so that Christ can be fully formed within and that Christ can be fully manifested from within. And so I knew it, I knew it will not go very far teaching on the fruit of the Spirit and not come back to Christ who has become our grand subject. Everything we teach will end up with Christ. And I'm so excited about this, uh, this turn of things that as we now look at Christ, who is the model son, the pattern son, is the one that we must be conformed to. He's the image and likeness of God. As we now begin to measure ourselves against the standard of God called Christ in this particular area of love, and we'll go through all the nine fruit of the Spirit. And we'll look at the model and the pattern set for us in Christ. And you'll be so surprised that ultimately, all the nine fruit of the Spirit, in a sense, is a description of Christ's character, nature, and lifestyle. Welcome to Christ. Welcome to true Christ-likeness. Welcome back to the garden where the image and likeness of God is made complete. Welcome to living according to the first principles, according to the foundation of God, which is already laid. No man can lay any other foundation. The World Health Organization cannot lay another foundation. Our governments cannot lay another foundation. If they do, whatever they lay will be erroneous. Our politicians cannot lay another foundation. If they do, they will lay a foundation that cannot carry the weight. God has laid in Zion. God laid a foundation before the laying down of the foundations of the earth. There's a lamb that was slain, even Christ. And our return, the return to our nations, the return of our nations, the return to Christ, the return of our politicians and our systems, the return of every human system back to Christ, there shall we find our healing. You know, the world is in a self-destructive mode as we speak through what we call wisdom and knowledge, systems and structures. We have departed from the ancient foundation. Many of us are ashamed of the ancient foundation. Some will not even want to mention his name anymore. Some wish there was a way we could expurge and completely remove the name of God from the earth. But you know what? Psalm chapter 2 already prophesied. The end is going to be something like this. When nations conspire and arise against God and the Christ and his son, God will look at that and laugh at the foolishness and then place a demand on the earth that until you kiss the son, you have no peace. The healing of the nations is in the kissing of the sun. But before the nations can kiss the sun, the nations must see the sun. And they see the sun through the sons of God that are producing the fruit of God. Love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the Lord bless you as you take time to pray. Ask God to help you to do some introspection and allow him to begin to prune you, to clean you, if not cut off some things within you that are not fruitful. So Father, I thank you this day. And I thank you for your word. Your command is not burdensome. Your word is a resource. Your word is not a liability. Even when the word rebukes and cuts us to the core, it is still divine resource. Your word carries you alive and your spirit. And thank you for your word that came to us so clearly, so expressly today, to enable us to rise up, to step up, to upgrade everything within us as we represent Christ in the earth, in our various offices and homes and estates and streets and careers and occupations. Wherever we find ourselves, Lord, we are going to represent you by the help of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up all the hands. One accord. Singing, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name.